Welcome to the uh, to the second of the two stay standing now. Um, to the uh, two lectures that I'm doing on this module. And this week we're doing Rethinking Global Politics, Power and Resistance. Whatever that might mean. But and I thought we might continue some of the themes that we were discussing, or I was lecturing on last week, when we were looking at cosmopolitan democracy. And I was sort of problematizing some of our discussions in the 90s. We were looking at David Held's uh, Democracy and Global Order. And I was intimating that even though cosmopolitan democracy theories about domesticating the international sphere, um, developing new forms of governance and global sovereignty, overcoming the anarchy, problematic and traditional international relations, the division between different states competing in this sphere of anarchy, that those frameworks were normally understood as liberal or liberalizing frameworks, going beyond realism, to something that we called um, a liberal internationalist understanding. And we had a bit of a discussion where I was just talking um, about issues around humanitarian intervention, about individual rights against sovereign rights. And towards the end of that session, I was suggesting that maybe there was just, there was more going on than just a liberalizing discourse. And that there were some problems of just understanding the 90s debates in a narrow framework of realism against liberalism, and liberalism being the victors. That's sort of like maybe realism won after the Second World War, a sort of potted history of international relations, where we think of the beginning of the discipline after the First World War, and we think that liberal ideas dominated, that we could just think of a rational way of organizing the international sphere, we could abolish war, we could all live happily and think about investing our money in resolving other problems. We understood that very crudely as, a, as a, uh, a sort of a domination of liberal ideas of the international sphere, that rights and laws could be safeguarded and secured internationally. And then after the Second World War, we tend to understand our discipline as dominated by realism, dominated by the ever-present threat of war in the sphere of anarchy, the thing that all the good things were kept inside states, arguments about rights and ethics and community and progress, and that in the international sphere there was just conflict and not conflict, that there was no understanding of progress and ethics and community. So we understand the Cold War period, the period after the Second World War, as dominated by realism. And then in these discussions, these ways of understanding, we normally think that after 1989, with the end of the Cold War, there's a sort of a rejection of realism, this idea that states just pursue their narrow interests, that international relations is all about war, conflict, armies, nuclear bombs, ideological divisions. And we sort of think that there was a liberal period of thinking. And the stuff that we were looking at last week, ideas about cosmopolitan democracy, Mary Caldor, David Held, Daniela Archibucci, Andrew Linklater, whoever else we were sort of thinking about, they're normally understood as liberal theorists, arguing that we can actually have a global community instituted where law and rights might operate equally regardless of what states we happen to be born into. So we sort of did that last week, and I was sort of arguing that looking back, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that there was more going on than just a traditional cosmopolitan liberal internationalism. But Maybe there was also a critique of our classical and traditional liberal assumptions. Because uh, what they were arguing was that we could have a global community, an internationalization of law and rights, but we didn't need, really need a global sovereign. They, they argued that we could still have the world as it was, a world divided into states, but we could also have a global and an international framework of justice as well. 
but really, it didn't really matter whether we were doing politics inside states or doing international politics, that we could somehow think of a framework of justice and a framework of order that blurred those divisions and those barriers. So they were sort of working in quite a grey area where we began to imagine that we didn't live in a world of states, where sovereignty wasn't what it used to be, and yet we weren't quite in a one world, one government, world police, world army, <coughs> world judiciary, a formalised institution of a framework of rights and equality. So they were working in quite a grey area. And even though it sounded like it was liberal, and just universalising the framework of a domestic state, <coughs> It was actually working in this in-between area where suddenly it seemed not to matter whether we were inside or outside, whether we were citizens or non-citizens. And, and I'm suggesting that you could read this sort of framework as quite a critique of traditional liberal understandings because when we talked about cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitan citizens and cosmopolitan rights, we didn't really quite have a liberal rights subject the subject of those rights wasn't autonomous. Often when we talked about humanitarian intervention and human rights, we talked about rights of intervention, <coughs> that other people needed rights in order to protect other people, the human rights victims. So we'd moved beyond a period of self-activity of the subject, traditional liberal frameworks of law and rights and representation, and we were thinking about how international actors could act on behalf of other people. We had this discourse of rights, but actually the people who were seen to have rights didn't necessarily have any say over what international policy was or how those rights might be acted upon. So, what I was suggesting at the end of last week is that we could draw some links between this cosmopolitanist idea <coughs> that we should get away from liberal binaries of insides and outsides does it matter if there's a sovereign or not a sovereign? And we were beginning to understand maybe a more sociolo sociologized frame of the world, where all our traditional understandings of the autonomy of politics and the artificial nature of this formal sphere of politics and law was no longer so important. And we looked a bit at the blurring of the political sphere into the social and economic sphere in the idea of democratizing everyday life democratizing our work relations or our family relations, that the idea of cosmopolitan democracy sort of took democracy out of that very narrow sphere where in traditional liberal frameworks we thought about democracy and rights. Um, does that make any sense to you? Sort of. Um, because when we talk about the autonomy of politics, we normally mean, and I think I mentioned this last week, but just to be clear, under normal liberal framings or under framings of modernity or sometimes capitalism, we use different words for these things, there was a separation between politics and economics. The, the sphere of politics and of law and of democracy and rights was an artificial one where we had equality at the ballot box or equality under the law but that was artificially fra framed through the framework of the state and through government. And in our spontaneous, private, informal, social and economic lives, clearly there's all sorts of inequalities being reproduced. Clearly not everyone is equal. So when we talk about law and politics, we're talking about formal rights, a formal equality, an artificial sphere of politics and law, where regardless of how educated we are or how much money we have, we have this area of equality where the law should treat us equally, where we should have the same say, the same representation at the ballot box. So it's quite artificial. But that was sort of central to the, the liberal framework of a state and a political sphere that stood above or independently or autonomously from economic and social relations. So even though we looked like we were equal, if you were a Marxist or a critical theorist, you'd say, but actually we were exploited in the social sphere. Even though it seems like an equal exchange between capitalist and worker, that actually in the social economic sphere of production, a surplus is produced and workers are exploited. Or if we were feminists, we'd say, yes, 
everyone looks equal, but that ignores the division between the public sphere and the private sphere, where women are forced into doing more private toil. So all those divisions can be criticised, but I'm just saying they were quite fundamental for a liberal understanding of politics and law, and in terms of your module, for order and justice. However much we might criticise liberal frameworks from whatever position we might have, it's still important to sort of understand what they were based on. They were based upon a presumption that all individuals are sort of born equal or are naturally equal, that we're all autonomous, rational, independent, that regardless of our other inequalities, we're all capable of being responsible, bound by our word, uh, bound to the law that's um, decided by governments. The basis for that formal equality is this assumption, I guess, of a real equality of individuals. And clearly, you might argue that inequalities are important, whether we own factories or own nothing but our labour, or what gender we are, and all the rest of it. Okay, so, what I was suggesting was that the cosmopolitan Democrats sought to move ideas of justice and order and democracy away from those formal frameworks. They said, that surely the international community, NATO, the UN, the EU, international actors could act on behalf of other people and save them, protect them, uh, institute their human rights without necessarily being formally accountable to them, like in organising democracy and law on the basis of a state. So there was a sort of introduction of, I guess, an understanding of ethics or a way of going beyond traditional liberal frameworks and ties of representation in order to begin this transformative process of going beyond the boundaries of nation states into a global world. So, so what I want to talk about today is, um, I guess, more critical understandings or ways in which that critique of those liberal binaries of the autonomy of politics have been extended. And so many people, as I suggested last week, are critical of ideas of cosmopolitan democracy critical of the uh, so-called extension of liberal norms and values and rights and law to the global sphere. And I think there's good reasons to be critical, because as I've said, the right subject begins to lose its relationship to power. It loses its basic understanding of being autonomous and of being rational. And so, Tom told me that some weeks ago you'd been looking at Hart and Negri's empire. And they make... I don't know how deeply you were looking at it. Um, anyway, so they make some similar points. They're quite critical, I guess, of a liberalising cosmopolitan democracy framework of understanding, extending the frameworks of domestic states to the global level. And I think you were looking at Empire, which is one of their, their earliest of their trilogy on international relations. But nowadays, people would also look at people like Giorgio Agamben, and they would be arguing that these discourses of rights and law and the human, rather than being liberating and universalizing, are actually subjecting. Because uh, under the names of the discourse of the human, states can be intervened in, and other actors can assume what's in other people's interests. And they argue that um, talking about the subject of rights in these frameworks just reduces the subject to an object to be looked after and to be protected rather than a subject capable of claiming their own rights, having their own rationality, establishing their own frameworks of government. So there's a critique of liberal discourses and understandings of rights which would argue that these rights have always been oppressive, that the subject of liberal government, the citizen, is always someone that's going to be regulated and subjected to power, interpolated in different ways. So on the one hand you have in the 90s, this liberalising discourse of rights and of law, of order and justice, which is seen as liberating, freeing us from the constraints of nation states, those little black boxes in which we're divided and dominated by nationalist frameworks and separated from each other. We can't talk about other global issues like <coughs> we discussed last week. On one level, that's seen as highly positive and liberating and in a process teleologically leading us to some resolution of our social, economic and political problems. In another way, there's this critique of this liberal framework. And it argues that this globalising of our political and social relations is an oppressive one. So, 
But also, so that's like with any of these issues around liberalism, liberal categories, there's an area of different subjective or normative understandings. And so just as some people might argue, liberalizing the international sphere is positive, for other people it's negative and oppressive. And when you do your readings, you can look at those sorts of debates and discussions. However, um, I think what I want to suggest is that in the 90s, we had very much a discussion centered around a liberal understanding of the international sphere. That either it could only be understood as based on sovereignty and anarchy, or it could be understood as getting rid of nation states as autonomous actors and as globalizing the international sphere. And the whole discipline of international relations has really been understood on that basis of two different alternatives. Either we have anarchy or we have sovereignty. Either we have a political community or we have a state of nature. Either we have law and rights and shared understandings or we have nothing. And that's where political theory was always separated from traditional realist international relations, where all the good things were inside states. And so we understood that if we only had these two options, um, then we were on the way from one to the other. The end of traditional international relations, realist understandings of security, order and justice could only be seen and understood as some transition to a global understanding. Now what I want to suggest is that today, I think, or since the end of the 90s, we've sort of moved away from this traditional liberal binary of either the international or the global. And I think that in doing that, we've moved beyond uh, a traditional liberal framework of understanding of politics and the separation of politics from economics and social relations. And that generally, we have a fairly poor view of any separation of politics, any formalized understanding of equality and rights and representation. And I want to argue that in relationship to two, I guess, two books that you might or might not be familiar with. Firstly, just looking at Hart and Negri stuff that you're already familiar with, to a certain point. And then uh, a book that came out last year, um, Cudworth and Hobden's Post-Human International Relations. So, uh, sorry, Erica Cudworth, C-U-D-W-O-R-T-H, and Stephen Hobden, H-O-B-D-E-N, Post-Human International Relations. Now, I want to sort of argue that we went from a world of international relations in the Cold War, where we're all divided and separated, to various global understandings of the human in the 90s, where we're all part of a collective community. We thought of the possibilities of law, rights, politics, order, and justice, to something else in the 2000s, in the period that we live in now. And that's generally called the post-human period. And I think it would be up, it might be useful for you to think about what sort of processes went on when we moved away from our realist world of contested politics and war and struggle to something that we called a more human or liberalizing or cosmopolitan understanding of us as all being one collective human family to something that nowadays we call the post-human, which has a different perspective. And in some ways it continues the trajectory, the post-human, because it says rather than being divided, you can see that we're then growing into a collective community in our global village of humanity, the post-human says we're growing even more in terms of our community and our collectivity. That also, there's not just humans, that there's, as earthlings, we need to critique these narrow and restricted understandings of humans and their interests. And hum humanity as somehow separate to nature or non-human agents and beings. Or even humanity as separate to you know, non-living beings. So on one level you can see that we've moved towards a more collective way. Once we begin to think of how we do politics in a post-human way, when we think about the interests of the biosphere and the environment, other forms of life that we entirely depend on to exist, 
we've got an even more inclusive, more collective, more global understanding of order and justice, which is what your module's about. So in one way you can see the shift from realism of doing our order and justice in little boxes to then doing it more broadly in a global human sense, but still having some traditional legacy of politics and representation and liberal understandings going on more broadly to a more global, inclusive understanding of order and justice. And in that way, of that broader understanding, we move entirely beyond our traditional disciplines of the social sciences and our liberal teleologies, and, and understanding that humans could somehow operate in their own little separate bubble and come up with our theories of the world and our sciences and just act on them and impose them on, on the outside world. We sort of understand that the human is a bit like our previous understanding of a state living in a world of international relations. That the human cannot just do things and understand things and act as if we just lived in a little box of humanity without sharing our planet, as I said, with other non-human actors and also inanimate actors as well. If you see what I mean. So on one level you can see a continuation and a trajectory. And if we were to look at the world like this, which I suggest you might want to think about, that also makes us begin to question whether we really were engaged in a liberal discourse in the 90s of going beyond the international to the global, even though initially it seemed liberal, just like an extension of our understandings of law and rights from a domestic state framework, from here where we are, we can see that actually maybe we're moving away from liberalism altogether, moving away from traditional under understandings of communities with securing capacities and with rights and with possibilities of development and freedom. That's all I'm sort of suggesting. Now, I'm not sure if it's entirely clear, and I'm only really thinking about it myself. And if you were to read the thing for your readings next week, which I happen to have written on the international to the global. Has anyone looked at that yet? I know it's next week and everything. Anyway, all I'm saying is that some time ago when I wrote that, I wasn't where I am now. It's the same, you know, workers are the same as students. Every day we read things and, you know, we think things and all the rest of it. It's a process of progress. So all I'm trying to say is that what I'm saying to you in this lecture is, <coughs> It's a bit of a development on the framework that I lay out in that paper if you were to read it and discuss it in your seminars next week. It's still the same basic framework about looking at these transitions from the international to the global, how we might understand it in liberal terms or not. But it's just reflected upon slightly differently. Which I think is fair enough. Because um, if we weren't developing our thinking then we wouldn't really be doing much thinking. I'm just saying that, in case you were to read it. Okay, so what I'm suggesting is that we can reflect upon those 90s discussions uh, as, on one hand, being framed within the traditional discipline of international relations, which is, I guess, a liberal discipline in terms of political theory, and as a critique of those frameworks, and a critique of the understanding of a separation between politics and economics. And without a separation between politics and economics, <coughs> you wouldn't have nation-states. Nation-states are part of the artificial framework in which we do politics and law and constitute ourselves as part of a community with rights and with order and justice. Social and economic relations continue across the barriers of nation-states. Nation-states are a purely political product, an artificial form of division in which we constitute that artificial sphere of rights and of government, collective representation of us as having a government as an actor being able to engage in the world and represent us in different ways and over which we used to struggle in the political process. So without the autonomy of politics, without that separation, there'd be no need for that separate sphere inside that box. There'd be no need for those boxes. So what we're talking about, when we're talking about the developments of our thinking of order and justice in international relations, is how those boxes become disappeared in our discussions and our frameworks of understanding. How we imagine a world of order and justice 
without the artificiality, without that artificial sphere of representation, without that world where democracy and elections is seen as really important, without that world where the formal framings of law and us as legal or right subjects being the crucial factor. So, on one level it is artificial. The sphere of politics and law in the state is artificial. The division of the world into states is artificial. You know, capitalism, social relation, all those things don't work in boxes of the state. They all work globally. It's only politics and law that work in those boxes. Anyway, so the point I'm making is that Held and the Cosmopolitan Democrats already begin to encourage us in the 90s to think and reflect upon the artificiality of what we call order and justice shaped by those boxes. We talked a bit about that last week. They talked about how we do an order and justice globally beyond those boxes with a framework of rights and of justice which is different to the frameworks inside those boxes. You know, going beyond the formal limits of representation, thinking about how we involve NGOs and global civil society in policy making, thinking about how we have the right to act and assist people um, that aren't part of our democratic community, but nevertheless are suffering human rights abuses, ethnic cleansing, etc. So, they start us thinking about going beyond the autonomy of politics and these separations, even though we call them liberal. It's mainly because they were nice and positive and happy clappy about all these things. If they'd been really negative and critical, then we could have called them post-structuralists or critical theorists or who knows what. Anyway, so Hart and Negri that you've already looked at, they're more critical. They wouldn't call themselves liberals. They'd call themselves Marxists and critical theorists and post-structuralists and all those other words that we use for people that say something similar but are doing it from a more critical perspective. And Hart and Negri, I know maybe you've already done this or maybe not, they argue that we live in a world without the formal sphere of politics and representation. That if we were to even begin to think about living in a world where we did our politics inside these boxes of nation states, we would be in fact that we can maybe operate inside states in, form, in terms of an opposition, but when it comes to actually taking power, thinking about representation of one little section of humanity, all our radical and critical understandings would be muted and tamed as we're shaped by this collective national interest. We talked about those things last week a bit. What Hart and Negri say is that when we do our real politics, we do it outside of any artificial framework of representation. We do it outside of elections. We do it outside of this artificial framework of law and politics. And we do it globally. For them, in fact, cosmopolitan democracy isn't like a teleological future. The world where we do our politics independently of these frameworks is here and now. So what they argue is that we live in a world of empire, empire, not in a world of nation states, but in a world of global empire. And these arguments are developed further in their second book, the book after this on multitudes and on commonwealth. It's like a trilogy, which you might want to look at. It doesn't, I think multitude is the best book, but empire is probably better known. Anyway, they argue that we do our politics outside of these artificial frameworks, and that we do our politics and our struggles directly against empire. So, I mean, you may... You have discussed this already with Tom. This particular point about the end of mediation and the end of the formal sphere of politics. Everyone should know what no. empire is, yeah. Anyway, anyway, so, 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 stop, stop, stop. <laughs> anyway, so, they don't argue that we live under empires in old-fashioned empire when we lived in a world of competing empires. They argue that there's one empire, there's one world, that uh, empire is a form of domination and of rule that reinforces and reproduces relationships of domination and inequality and of capitalism etc. That there's no formal government, but a fluid, networked system of the reproduction of the relations of power in which the most dominant states, like America, like Europe, 
assist in that reproduction, but they don't follow their own separate competing interests like in a world of realism. So for Hart and Negri, it's a bit like we have a liberal world or a cosmopolitan world. We've gone beyond the world of nation states, but to understand how power operates today in a more fluid and networked uh, sort of uh, framework, that we should understand it as one large empire and continually at different levels the relations of power and dominations are being reproduced. A little bit like what David Held was arguing about cosmopolitan democracy, how all these different levels we need to think about empowering the subject and doing democratization, not just in one space. Anyway, so what they argue is that we struggle directly against empire. Now how do we do it? We don't do it in the little boxes of formal voting and law uh, and at the level of the nation state. We struggle against empire differently. Our forms of resistance um, are sort of multifarious in different ways. We struggle against power, the reproduction of our dominant social relations, the ways in which we're interpolated as passive subjects or have different identities in different ways. So if you, were, if you go on strike, if you were a worker, if there were still workers and you went on strike, that would also be a struggle against empire and the reproduction of power. If you were protesting about uh, the building of a new airport or you know, other frameworks of environmental destruction, which again seem to reproduce dominant relations of power, the needs of the economic and social system, you'd also be struggling against empire. If you refuse to do your reading for next week's seminar, you'd also be resisting the way that we try and interpolate you as independent, critical thinking academics. You know, we're not coming to lectures. That um, our frameworks of resistance operate in a multitude of different ways in the different processes and the different networks in which we're embedded. So this is a form of resistance and a form of challenge which we can see has got very little to do with our traditional understandings of politics in these artificial spaces where there's representation, political parties, and the desire to form a government. And what Hart and Negri do is they say their next book is Multitude. So what they're arguing is that we're constituted and reproduced as a multitude, as a multitude that's always struggling against empire. In fact, our struggle against empire comes first. It then enables empire to sort of fight back and attempt to re-regulate us, re-territorialize us, uh, constrain us in different ways. <coughs> so politics becomes much more part of our everyday lives. Politics as in struggle and resistance against empire. <coughs> as we're globalizing politics, as we're going beyond doing politics, in this case, understanding order and justice in the boxes of nation states, what we're beginning to do is to take politics out of that artificial realm, order and justice out of that artificial realm, and bringing it into the social realm of our everyday lives, where we're continually engaged in a struggle, continually engaged in different ways of thinking about order and justice, of creating or instantiating our own understandings of order and justice in our own sets of different relations. It's a little bit like David Held in every sphere of life becoming democratized, but this is like saying that in, a, in real life, in the real processes of the fluidity of our different networks and engagements, in our everyday types of struggle, we're continually reshaping ourselves and challenging the frameworks of power. Hart and Negri also say that these different struggles are incommunicatable. And they give examples whether you're striking workers or rioting in a city youth, uh, or struggling in liberation struggles or resistance to oppressive regimes, that there's thousands or millions, or everyone is involved in thousands of struggles. So there's, you know, a thousand million multiplied by whatever. That um, all these struggles take place, but they're not necessarily communicatable, i.e., they do not take place within these old fashioned ideological frameworks of left and right and forming political parties and creating some framework of a political program and political agreement through organizing in some formal political way. That without all the constraints of doing politics inside nation states with liberal frameworks of representation, that 
the struggle against empire, politics and resistance, becomes everywhere, in fact. In fact, that's the slogan, isn't it? We are everywhere. Isn't that part of the radical politics? So what I'm sort of saying is, once we begin to tear, to tear away at the artificial liberal binaries, the understanding of doing order and justice in the artificial boxes of the nation state, it's not necessarily the case that we're liberalizing the international sphere. It's not necessarily the case that we're creating this artificial framework of law and rights and equality all around the globe. What seems to be the case more is that we're doing a post-liberal understanding of international relations and of power and of order and justice, or a post-human understanding. Where rather than liberalizing the global or the international, we're bringing our understanding of order and justice and politics into the social and economic sphere of our everyday life. And it seems that struggle doesn't take this form of left and right or one nation against another nation in this artificial space of politics. It seems that struggle happens in many multitudinous different ways without some political clarification, without some particular space, that anywhere where we are, there can be this struggle against empire because it doesn't need to take an articulated political ideological framing and it doesn't need the ontological focus of being focused on the state and state power. So we have a sociologizing of power and domination where, where ideas and understandings of order and justice become part of our everyday life and our everyday life engagements and our experiences. <coughs> That's very different from just seeing order and justice and politics at this global level, like an extension of the domestic state and its frameworks and institutions spreading from just being at the top of a state to being at the top of a global level. What I want to sort of suggest is that our more radical and critical understandings basically remove the artificiality or the autonomy of politics and enable us to focus on our everyday lives and the different processes that we're embedded in. And I think that going beyond that, that's, that is once we've reduced politics to our everyday and the social and economic sphere, we can then begin to think more in the post-human terms about the global and our lives and our experiences and our problems. Because once politics becomes embedded in our everyday lives and our everyday processes and our everyday existence, it doesn't seem that humans are so special or so different from other animals and animate forms of life that we share our planet with. They're also struggling in embedded ways to reproduce and to survive and to sustain themselves. And for our everyday lives and our struggle for existence, we're dependent on clean air and water and the biosphere and earthworms and bumblebees and all these other frameworks of life. And when we think about our politics globally, when we think about order and justice, what people would argue is that it's not going to work if we just think about a human understanding of order and justice, what's in our short-term interests, in a sort of selfish way, because we wouldn't even be able to fulfil our own interests as earthlings living on this planet if we didn't think about sustainability, if we didn't think about the biosphere, if we didn't really take seriously these issues of the environment, and these global issues. So once we start thinking politics globally, rather than the boxes of the nation state, once we start doing politics and thinking about order and justice as part of the reproduction and the struggles of our everyday lives, that whole sphere, that whole liberal understanding begins to evaporate and to dissolve. Once, as, her, well, as David Held and the Cosmopolitans tell us, once we move beyond majoritarian rule and frameworks of representation, once we start thinking about the needs of others, as we do in the human rights and the humanitarian in intervention discourses, there's, there's really no gap between doing that and thinking about the needs of earthworms, the needs of the planet more broadly, um, the needs of other ecosystems, and the needs of the biosphere. And we think about how we might do global politics, how we might have global understandings of order and justice, which have got very little to do with doing politics and creating frameworks of community in this artificial space of this liberal framework of, of politics and law as we used to understand it. So, what I'm sort of suggesting is that in globalised, 
in our discourses of globalizing or internationalizing or liberalizing, in our discourses of going beyond the nation state and international relations as a framework of understanding order and justice, we're doing much more than just spreading these understandings geographically. We're also transforming our understandings of what it means to do politics, how we can think about order and justice, and transforming and critiquing a lot of those liberal assumptions upon which our understandings of rights and order and justice and law uh, were based on and how they developed. So that's all I'm sort of saying, that when you're doing some readings, if you just sort of think about those discourses of the 90s and how they operated and how they lead to much more global and post-human understandings. And um, that also might enable us to reflect upon what exactly is happening in terms of our radical and critical understandings of politics. Whether we are doing politics at a global level as in a, a concentrated concern, or whether we're sort of giving up on politics and seeing it as too artificial, too problematic, too oppressive, and sort of shrinking down into the politics of our everyday lives. Sometimes it's very difficult to, to, to tell the difference between an expansion of our aspirations and our, our critical endeavours to the global sphere and a reduction of them just down into like how our everyday consumption of or shopping or using water or thinking environmentally about our human footprint. It seems very difficult to disentangle, once we go beyond those liberal frameworks, whether we're doing something much more expansive or whether we're actually retreating from the world just into our own everyday life and spending a lot and being quite narcissistic about the global importance of every little act that we do. So um, those are the basic points that I think I wanted to say about that. Now, there's hardly any time, but has anyone got any questions? Okay, good, good. So, um, good luck with the rest of your module.